Welcome back to the channel, guys. Woo-wee, was I wound up on the last one, hey? <laughs> Just dealing with a lot of different frustrations on a lot of different levels with this project. And uh, kind of gets to me a little bit when it all has to get brought back to the surface again and go through that whole thing. Uh, just very, very annoying. But I am very happy to be at a point where the problem has been solved. Now I can just keep moving on this project. So it's all good. Today is a new day. Today is a better day. I need to finish dropping these liners in here and doing my final protrusion checks, which probably doesn't matter at this point anyway, because I think everything is going to wind up being the way it was supposed to be in the first place. But I need the satisfaction of measuring that and writing all those numbers down and seeing that everything is as perfect as what I imagined it being in the first place. So <laughs> excuse me while I drop those liners in and redo my measurements. And while I'm working on that, I feel like I need to justify myself a little bit for the timeline on this thing because uh, as long as this tractor and block have been sitting here, I mean, it doesn't take that long to figure these things out. But the problem is, when you're doing mechanics like this, it's not like an office job where you send an email or a phone call, you make a phone call, and then while you're waiting for your answer back, you're kind of just in the office waiting by the phone anyway, or by your computer. No, this is a little different. Like, I've got work scheduled all over the place. Some work in the shop, some work out in the field. And I often am working in areas where I just don't even have cell service or anything like that. Uh, communication becomes very difficult. And the next thing is sometimes you get involved in other work that is scheduled and might be a combine inspection that, you know, kind of ties you up for a week, week and a half, something like that. Or it might even be just a simple electrical problem that winds up turning into some horrendous long project that you didn't see coming. All that time, I'm not really here working on this. I kind of got to get that finished to get back to this. And then you get this far on this one and now you got to wait again. I mean, a couple of times I had to wait for another set of liners to come in or another liner. Lots of time I spent waiting for uh, callbacks and emails back of different contacts I have. I was questioning, trying to find out what in the world is going on. So it's just... While I'm waiting for stuff to happen on this in the background, I, I'm busy doing other jobs. And sometimes it can be three, four, five, seven, ten days before I'm back on this again, just to find out one other little small problem. And then I got to wait again and then get back on a different job. And boy, it just doesn't take long. And that time disappeared fast. So it seems a little crazy to think that a month or three or four can swing by and you don't get much progress done on this. But that is the reality of how these things go sometimes. And I absolutely hate when stuff like that happens, especially in a project like this, like this tractor was supposed to go out for spring planting and we missed that because I didn't even have a block back yet. I sent the block to the machine shop and it sat there for months waiting in line for a bunch of reasons there. I think I talked about that in a previous video. But all these things, they all add up and stack up, and before you know it, months have gone by, and you still got this project that hasn't gone anywhere, you know? I'm very fortunate my customer on this one has been extremely patient and very understanding. And, uh, you know, I have definitely had guys that were a lot harder to work with, and. I mean, I'm under the pressure because I know this has to get out and these guys are relying on me. They're depending on me. Like, let's go. Let's get this done. This doesn't take this long. And I, I know I get it, but I'm kind of got my hands tied in a lot of these things. There's not a whole lot I can do sometimes. I mean, none of this is my fault, but it is my responsibility as the engine builder to overcome whatever hurdles are here. But it's... Uh, it's so challenging sometimes to know, you know, when this backs up into other work that was already scheduled the year before, do you back up all that work for six months while you work on this and wait for something to happen? Or do you try and balance it? Or do you forget about this and just do the other stuff? I try to balance it is what I do, but it's uh, sometimes just does not feel like that wants to work properly either. So all you guys that want to go on your own, everybody always, thinks that you're gonna have no stress and make millions of dollars going on your own. It don't work that way. 
It kind of takes a special breed to do this kind of stuff, and I'm not intending to toot my own horn here. I think you guys know that, but it's just reality. So give me a few minutes here, guys. I'm going to go through, check all my protrusions, copy this all down, and once I have everything recorded, uh, I'll come find you with the computer there, and we'll go through it together, and then let's keep going on this, because I want this out of my shop. Well, there it is, guys. We got back to our counterboard depth, 0 0.00063. So it's uh, just over half a thousandth of an inch spread. And then our liner protrusion before the machining, you can see number three was below the deck. Number five wasn't, but after machining it was because the liners are made different now. Then we get down to our liner protrusion after machining. I fixed all these numbers and put the current numbers in from measuring from the very outside of that flange. And ironically, just like we were just over half a thousandth of spread on the counterbore depth measurements, that's exactly the same as the sleeve depth measurements. We're within a little over a half a thousandth of an inch from front to back. So that means this all measures out exactly perfect. And the only thing I've changed was where I'm measuring on that sleeve. Ah, so frustrating. I don't like this new tool for measuring these. It would be better if it had a magnet on the bottom like my deck bridge does, that would make it a lot better and it would also be better if this had a little bit more reach. I find that these corners want to butt up against when you're trying to do in between these. So you can't, I like to, just because it's easier in my brain, I like to do my measurements here, 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 and here, but I can't do a measurement in here with this block just because of the way it's made. It, it doesn't fit, doesn't reach far enough. So I have to be like here and here and here and here, which is fine. It's just not what I'm used to. So therefore it's just not what I like but it does work, it's fine. Now that all those liner measurements are RC Diesel approved, I can take all those liners back out, clean this block up really nice. I gotta blow through all the oil galleries and do all that stuff and clean it up good and proper so it's ready for assembly. Now I know, I know, you're thinking, well, you did all this waiting. Why didn't you clean up these parts? Well, I'll tell you why. Because as long as that stuff is sitting around, it's getting dirty. So if I had gone through and cleaned this up all really nice and proper and then wound up having to load it in the back of the truck and take it back to the machine shop, which I did, it gets all dirty again and I have to go through and clean the whole thing again. So it's a complete waste of time. And then what if I clean it again and then I found out that I needed to send this back to the machine shop to get them to shave the top off some more, like was the original plan for a while there. Again, I just have to re-clean the whole thing again. So I very rarely will clean all these parts until I'm pretty much ready to assemble them because like I say, as long as they're sitting around, they're just getting dirty again and then I gotta clean and then I gotta clean again and I gotta clean again and I really don't like cleaning.
Well there, we got that all nice and cleaned up now. Went through and cleaned up all the oil galleys inside, blew them all out, cooling passages. I just have to remember to put all those plugs back in all these places before the engine goes back together because otherwise we're going to wind up with a huge oil leak. So at this point, I'm going to clean up the deck again. Just uh, put a little acetone and a rag through all these counterboards to make sure they're perfectly clean. Probably going to put a touch of anaerobic sealant around there. Again, it's not necessary, but I've been starting to do that. And then I'll put all the packings on these liners, soap them up, and we'll stuff them down in that block. You can see by these rags and the dirt that's on them that even though I washed this entire block and scrubbed it with brake clean and a brush, it's still dirty. And that's why it's, when you're doing engines, it's always cleaning and cleaning and cleaning and cleaning and cleaning. So this was from the lower counter bores mostly, and this was from the upper counter bores, which I've already washed, I don't know how many times with acetone. And then that was from the deck up top. So it should be pretty clean now. Okay, so the liners are in. So for those that are a little less technical, I'll explain what I was doing here. So first I took the anaerobic sealant and I put that around the counter bore. Not exactly necessary, but I'm starting to do that on these engines just to uh, give a little extra protection for coolant sneaking past and getting through the head gasket. Um, anaerobic just means that it doesn't harden or cure until you take the air away. So as long as that is sitting on there just in the open air, it doesn't, it doesn't harden. So it gives you some time to work with, so that's nice. Next thing I did was I soaked up the bottom counter bore, and then I soaked up the liners, and I'm just using uh, liner soap. Soap up the liners, and then uh, kind of wiggle them into place. I stood up on the lip here, put some weight on them to get them down as far as I could. And then once they were down that far, then I put the bolts in, used the bolts to slug them down. Once I had the liners pressed down with the bolts, then I took my uh, liner removing tool actually and put that on top and then whacked it with the dead blow a few times just to make really sure that these liners are seated because they are kind of press fit now they're pretty tight in there uh, they went down nice and nice and smooth but there's definitely some restrictions so these liners are really tight in these bores they're going to be last a long time but i used that tool with the dead blow just to make really sure they're seated then i double checked the torque on the bolts to make sure that they're held down i'm holding them down like this because those o-rings when they slide down there, a lot of times they have a tendency to want to push back up just because of the friction and stuff. Whacking it with the hammer like that helps jar those things and kind of get them in place as much as possible. On a press fit block like this, that's not going to make that much difference, but regardless, it's habit. That's what I did. And now the liners will stay held down with these bolts until I actually put the heads on. Um, so the next step on this now, the block has been cleaned, the liners are in, now I'm going to need to flip it upside down and we're going to have to start working on that crankshaft and getting it in there. And the reason why I do, did the liners first is because when you're soaping down in there, you tend to get soap dripped on different stuff. And if I have the crank in there and I drop the soap on it, now I have to clean the crank again. And you all know I just, I just love cleaning parts. See, I got a little happy and I dripped some soap on here. I want to paint this block later, so that's got to come off of there. My grandfather was a small engine repair mechanic and he taught me a lot of things. And one of the things he taught me is, if you don't make a mess, you don't have to clean it up. And that's kind of why I did that in the order that I did with uh, putting the liners in first. Putting the crank in, if I get oil all over the liners or something, that bothers nothing. You don't really have to clean that off, you just have to make sure it's not dirty. But getting soap on your crank, well, I don't want soap in there, in my bearings and stuff, so even though potentially it's harmless, but at the same time, 
It's just not, not good ethics in my book.